Oh. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're just waiting for all the attendees to populate in. Just give us a few minutes before we start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lambda Lip Fest. You are at the panel Sex and the Body. We are just waiting a few minutes to allow the attendees to populate in. Hello, everyone. Welcome. You are at Lambda Lip Fest final panel of the week, Sex and the Body. We're just waiting a couple minutes for all the attendees to enter the room. Okay, I think that we can go ahead and start. Welcome everyone. My name is Cynthia Guardado and I am the event producer for Landa Lit Fest 2020. Let us begin by acknowledging the traditional stewards of the lands we are all collectively standing on. We show gratitude to the Tongva people, past and present, for caring for this place that was stolen from them and that we now call Los Angeles and vow to help the Tongva gain federal recognition and autonomy. Please take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral people and land you are currently on by sharing their names in the chat. Hello and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for Lambda Lit Fest presents Sex and the Body. My name is William Johnson. I'm the Deputy Director of Lambda Literary and I'm thrilled to be your host for tonight's panel, which is the last event for this year's Lit Fest, which was a week long celebration of black LGBTQ artistry. This year's Lit Fest features some of our community's most dynamic performers in a series of conversations on art making, happiness and how to dismantle a white supremacist, ableist, cisgendered, heteronormative world. You can see videos from the past Lit Fist events at lambdaliterary.org. We also want you to know that a closed caption recording of tonight's event will be made available on our YouTube channel by next week. Before we begin tonight, I want to thank Lit Fest event producer, Cynthia Gardardo, for everything they have done over the past few months to bring Lit Fest to life. Thank you, Cynthia. It was heavy lifting and you've done a fantastic job. As a small LGBTQ arts nonprofit, we are very grateful to our sponsors. This year's Lit Fest is funded in part by an arts grant from the city of West Hollywood, as well as support from the California Arts Council and the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. Books have always been central to queer people's lives, which is why I'm so proud to work for this organization. There's no other organization like it. We lift up queer voices all year round through programs like the Lambda Literary Awards, the most prestigious prize for LGBTQ books. We also bring books into schools so that queer kids can see themselves reflected in the books they read. And we prepare future generations of queer writers by offering residencies and workshops exclusively for LGBTQ writers. These programs and others are made possible through the generosity of people just like you. I know times are tough for many of us right now, but if you're able to make a donation tonight, however small or large, please do. We set up a special text code to make it easy. You can give directly from your phone by texting the word LITFEST to 44 
three, two, one. That's LitFest to the number four, four, three, two, one. Like many people and organizations, we are facing significant financial challenges as an organization and donations of any amount are deeply appreciated. Also, I want to remind folks to join the conversation in the chat and to let you know there will be an audience Q&A session at the end of the general discussion. So drop your questions in the Q&A box. With that, I invite tonight's moderator, Kenyon Farrell to take center stage. Kenyon is a writer and activist splitting his time between New York City and Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you so much, William, and thank you so much, Lambda Lit, uh, for this incredible uh, week of um, Literary Festival again and being able to be flexible and flip it into a digital uh, Lit Fest this year uh, due to um, COVID-19 and the various shelter in place, stay at home, mask wear and shit we all up to these days. Um, and glad, thank you to the audience who has uh, joined us for tonight, uh, this Friday night. So um, this conversation tonight is uh, sex and body politics. So um, tonight, this panel, uh, there are, you know, no rules or, or norms to follow. No, you know, we ain't got to, you know, keep up a bunch of bougie shit. Like for this conversation, we can really go in. So um, we, you know, and the panelists are free to say whatever they want about sex in the body without censorship. Um, this is a conversation where Black, Indigenous, uh, other people of color, LGBTQIA plus writers will share how sex and uh, body politics manifest in their writing. Um, so I wanted to, uh, you know, introduce each of our um, panelists, um, you know, who's uh, work I'm, you know, huge fans of. Uh, but before I, I introduce them, um, I asked each of them to think before we started tonight, since we're talking sex in the body, it's Friday night. I don't know what plans y'all have after we leave here. But, you know, if um, my question to the, to the panel uh, <laughs> to get us started is, you know, in your uh, kind of private, you know, or maybe public, depending on how you get down, but your, you know, sexy time, when you get ready to get it popping, what's your, what's your soundtrack? What's your playlist? Uh, you can name artists, you can name album, you can name genre of music. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll kick it off that way. I'll start and model that particular question. So for me, it really kind of depends. I would say if it's, um, you know, if it's a boo thing moment where it's feelings involved, um, I'm like a 90s fucking, you know, trip hop. It's like more Chiba, Porter's Head, uh, Massive Attack, like that kind of moment. Um, <laughs> Bronte has fix your face. Um, <laughs> but if it's like, you know, uh, you know, a jump off from one of the apps is probably, you know, some trap shit. It's probably, you know, whatever um, so, you know so uh that's that's me um first introduction um first uh uh panelist uh tonight uh kokoma the queen of queer soul is a legendary award-winning musician poet and activist and we have i don't even think we've ever met before but i have seen you perform at different things behind the scenes and have been like, you know, fangirl and ever since. So uh, welcome, uh, Kokoma. And uh, question, what's your soundtrack when you want to get it popping? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, love. <laughs> well, you're still muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Hi. Hey, it's such a pleasure. I've heard of you for years too. <laughs> Just got to say that. Um, well, yeah, I'll, uh, the obvious choice I, I would listen to is Queer Soul, <laughs> my music. Um, I, like, I like to hear something queer, something black, something revolutionary. And if I'm not listening to myself, I love Rasan Patterson. Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, doesn't Rasan do it? I'm like, oh. Some Rasan Patterson. I love an openly gay black man singing femininely free like oh like I loved it I loved it. and I love having I love like fucking a nigga and he don't even know that that's a gay black man thing it's like this whole moment um Layla I love the androgyny of her instrument 
It always gets, Layla Hathaway always gets me in the mood. And of course, Anita and Sylvester. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Nishandi Anderson, uh, who is a creative nonfiction writer from Altadena, California, and is author of the forthcoming memoir titled Shooting Range. So Nishan, question for you. Soundtrack, when you like to get it popping, what you listening to? Situations, well not situations, but I get, you, can, you guys can hear me, right? Yes. I've been in so many different places and situations. Um, I don't have, I don't, I don't have a soundtrack. Um, as long as, as long as my neighbors or a <laughs> passerby, you know, couldn't or can't hear me, I'm fine with that. Um, but I would have to probably say if, if I was playing something, it'd probably be house music or some R&B music. Great. Something nice and sensual. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, third panelist, uh, Rhonda Gerard, uh, is the author of the forthcoming memoir, Love is the Next Country, uh, also author of the novel, A Map of Home, and a collection of short stories, Him, Me, Muhammad Ali. So Rhonda, what's your soundtrack? Uh, usually my soundtrack is, I'm, I'm a switch, so it's either my service top soundtrack or my pushy bottom soundtrack. Um, otherwise, it's just on my Discover Weekly or another playlist that I just have queued up. But... Cool, I'm with it. Thank you. <laughs> um, and last but not least uh, is Brontes Purnell. Uh, and Brontes is a 2018 Whiting Award recipient for fiction. Uh, his work weaves sustained narratives of sex and desperation, punctuated with triumph. Bronnie, what's your soundtrack? They still got that as my bio. <laughs> yes. Damn. You are, you are free to switch it up since you are now on the damn, you know, on the Zoom. So you can go ahead. Look, I get lots of emails all the time. Look, I don't. <laughs> I don't know how much triumph is left in my work, but what I will say. What I will say is, I don't really have a soundtrack. I am an intense top, so I demand a charged telepathic silence when I'm getting down. Like, I don't want no Gerald Levert or no baby face in the background yeah. distracting me from my stroke game, which is ancient yeah. and powerful. Um, yes. But there was a point when I was um, a child where I thought if I ever lost my virginity, it would be the Tony, Tony, Tony's anniversary. So that's the song that I always want to play when I'm losing my virginity, which essentially is every time I have sex. Yes. See, that that's that fun. cancer shit. So you talked all that shit and come and basically your answer is <laughs> Tony, Tony, Tony anniversary, like the most romantic, <laughs> sweetest song you can play, cancer. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, when was the last time you played that song for me, Kenya? Oh, don't, oh, don't be spilling tea. <laughs> uh, anyhow, darling, let's get started with our conversation. Um, so I thought one of the um, places, you know, to start certainly would be um, with Audre Lorde. And thinking about Audre Lorde's uh, well-known essay, um, Uses of the Erotic, uh, the Erotic as Power. And um, what she says in this, um, you know, essay is, the erotic functions for me in several ways. And the first is in providing the power which comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. The sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers which can be the basis for understanding. Much of what is not shared between them lessens the threat of their difference. Uh, and that deep and irreplaceable knowledge of our capacity for joy comes to demand from all of my life, comes to demand from all of my life that it be lived within the knowledge that such satisfaction is possible and does not uh, have to be called marriage nor God uh, nor an afterlife. This is the reason why the erotic is so feared and often so regulated to the bedroom alone when it is recognized at all. 
for once we begin to fully, uh, to feel deeply all the aspects of our lives, we begin to demand from ourselves and from our life pursuits uh, that they feel in accordance with that joy which we know ourselves to be capable of. Our erotic knowledge empowers us, becomes a lens through which we scrutinize all aspects of our existence, uh, forcing us to evaluate those uh, aspects honestly in terms of their relative meaning within our lives. And this is a grave responsibility projected from within each of us not to settle for the convenient, uh, the shoddy, the conventionally expected, nor the merely safe. Um, and I, I love that essay and I, I love that quote to sort of start us off for this, uh, you know, is, is for the panel and anyone can start. Um, how for you does the erotic in this sense show up in the process of writing or performing um, and how does it manifest in, in your work itself? I'll call your names out <laughs> if I have to. Um, I'll, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, it's all good. I think Nishan was about to jump in. Um, for several years, I used to I used to advertise um, erotic massages on Craigslist, Backpage, Arrows, all all on the internet, anywhere I could post an ad at. And I would always make sure that I would convey to my audience, to my future customers. Um, that I offered erotic massages and it was only a, an erotic massage. And someone would actually call me and ask me, you know, what does that mean? And I would always, sometimes I thought they were joking. I, I, you know, I'd be like, you know, are they that dumb? Like ero to me, erotic, it, it, it's as simple as that erotic. Like what, what more could you, you know, think erotic is? Um, some of them had no idea. They had no clue. So I would have to explain it to them. Um, that, you know, there's no penetration, but it, it's simply that it's an erotic massage. It's going to stimulate you sexually. Um, and so I used that in my advertising um, to convey to my customers that I did erotic massages. Cool. Thank you. Other responses to Audre Lorde's uh, framing for the use um. of the erotic and how it shows up in your work? I um I have written about sex before, but I like to call my work um, anti erotica, cause um it's uh it's built in the deficit of those areas where it's like you know um, everybody wants like the flowery Danielle Steele novel version of romance where they're just like getting fucked on a bed full of roses all the time, but sometimes I don't know you get fucked in an alleyway. And you might fall in dog shit and then the police come, you know. So I, I, I classify my work as uh, anti-erotic where mm. we're still of and relating to the body, but it may or may not be something you want to jerk off to once I finish telling you about it. For me, as a dark-skinned woman and a dark-skinned queer woman and a dark skin, queer woman of size and, and a musician, I look like when I write, I'm doing sex work. When I write a poem, that's sex work. When I write a song, that's sex work. When I shoot a video, that's sex work. I see musicians as sex workers. I see Beyonce as a sex worker. She may not be sucking dick, but that bitch is definitely selling pussy. Because when she on that motherfucking stage perking it, like the sun is going to split in half, that, that, that's sex work. And then when I write a poem, from my perspective, um, I always see my dark skin as the most sexual thing about me because as a dark skinned woman, it's what's most sexualized about me, right? And then like I have a fat ass, so it's like, mm. and then I think about what it is to be queer and intersex. I'm always looking at myself as like a mutant. And that's the reason why when I- Oh, we lost you, hit your, you unmute, love. Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I just see myself as a mutant, like X-Men. And so it's like everything I know about my body comes from the trauma and the abuse. And I'm always writing. And I'm, I'm always trying to, like, write a story where my sexuality is my salvation. It's not 
a devi- it's not a deviate, it's not a deviant thing, it's not a it's not a delinquent thing. It's like it's what I'm powerful for. Because I I'll be sure to complain later where I say beauty is my revenge. Because as a non cis woman, it's so powerful to have the men who used to beat me and rape me as a child and tell me I'm not beautiful. These are my t- these are my primary customers. That's a form of revenge for me, you know. And I see beauty as revenge, and I see sex as a re- form of revenge. Indeed, thank you. I like. I, I love that. I love hearing you say that. Um, and like, yeah, the trauma, like bringing that up too. The, the way that the erotic shows up for me or shows up in my work is it's just in everything. You know, I'm, I'm Palestinian and Egyptian. So all the, the reason I exist and look like this is because so many people were fucking while they were kind of traveling from Africa into Asia and back. That's me. That's, I am the result of the erotic. I, you know, and it might be also the result of violence. Um, wow. But it's, in me. it's all in me. So uh, I'm going to wield it as a light. I'm going to wield it as power for good. And when I yeah. write, it's just going to be a reflection of that, of my body, of my desire, which I, I am extremely horny. This pandemic is fucking awful for me. Um, but yeah, so, so writing, at least when I was a kid, I, I'll just say this, like the first erotic thing I wrote, I still remember because I was in my room and I was describing this hot woman just walking through a, a, a forest like naked and just like being crazy and, and you know, just being, uh, being a savage Arab. And my dad like saw it, read it and like ripped it up and was like, that's not what we write about. And, and that was when I was like, that's what I write about. Like I got so drawn to the taboo or whatever the fuck, right, of um, that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. No, uh, can I say something? Sure. Um, I, when I was 19, I was um, assaulted. And uh, my book, Shooting Range, it's based on that situation. And the individual um, who assaulted me, he's in prison. He's not in prison for what he did to me, but he's been in prison since 1997. And so I wrote him, I wrote him in 2007 because I wanted some insight into why he did what he did. And he wrote me back and it was pretty much, it was bullshit. I I don't know if I burnt the letters or cut them up. I don't, I don't have them. So I wrote him again in 2012, 13. And I um, decided to use a, a softer approach a more, I guess you would say, feminine approach. Um, I, I still have my letters. I didn't say sexual things to him because that's not what I, that's not how I was trying to, um, I wasn't approaching it. I wanted to talk to him, you know, based on his background, who he was, you know, what his motivation was. And he, when he responded, um, he told me that I was making his dick hard. He told me that it was so erotic. My, my letter that I wrote him had unintended con- consequences. Um, and maybe again, because he's in isolation and you know, no one's writing him and he remembered our first encounter, which was non-sexual. Um, so it, it was interesting how he took it as erotic and how what he wrote back to me, you know, things he was telling me he would you know, do and all, it, I, just completely shocked me. Um, so it's interesting, so you may not, you may not think or believe, you know, you're coming across erotic um, and you may not even be trying to, but to someone else, you, 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 you definitely could be. And I was, I was really, really shocked and surprised by his response. And I ended, I did get what I wanted in his story. I got him to open up and talk and everything. So, you know, whatever I said, it worked. Right. Thank you. I mean, it kind of leads me to my next question for y'all, I think, which is, you know, as, queer writers, um, you know, there's a certain amount of like, um, certain amount of our lives in terms of like our, you know, various, whether you consider it coming out or inviting in, you know, processes or whatever, but at the point at which you start to self-actualize sexually, and then also to realize your, you know, talent as a writer or you're getting, you know, as a performer or whatever, um, there's a, probably a certain expectation to a certain extent that we as queer folks like actually ground our work in sex, right? Or that sex and desire is somehow um, present in a particular kind of way. And so I'm curious to know, like, for you, um, you know, how do you, how, like, um, 
why does sex sort of uh, matter so much in, in the context of your own work? <clears throat> I'll say for me, Black queer desire is pertinent. Like being able to verbalize that I desire something, something sexually in my own context, Literally, it's powerful because, like, as a Black non cis woman, typically when I am depicted in the media sexually, it's in a deviant way. But when I create work, it's in a human, it's a, it's in a humane way. It's in a, a pinnacle way where it's all of my desire. It's not, it's not a kink. It's not a fetish. It's my sexuality. It's my sensuality. And who better than to right than myself so often the problem is art created for black women like myself isn't created by us and so the beauty of my music and my poetry and my art is that it's from the horse's mouth so that's why it's important because it's not about um it's not about anyone geppettoizing me if you will like you know mm. so often they like to treat us like the, they like to act like the geppetto no baby I'm Geppetto, Pinocchio, and I'm the string. I create it all. Anybody else? Or you... I could, mean, you ask, could you ask it again? Yeah, so the question is, um, why is it important to um, kind of write about sex and desire as part of your actual you know, practice as a, as a writer and as an artist? You know, I didn't, I didn't intend, I didn't, that, that was never my in, intention. It just so happens that my desires almost um, took my life away when I was 19 years old. So for, for, for me, this is 1997, 1996, you know, there's no, there's no, I don't have to say it, there's no social media. Where do, if you're a teenager or if you're, you know, almost a young adult, um, you can't go to gay clubs, you're not 21. How do you meet men? How do you meet healthy men? For me, I had been cruising since I was 13 or 14 years old, having sex in um, pub, the restrooms at the, 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 the malls, uh, just cruising. I was just cruising all over Southern California, and I was having a very, very good time. Um, and my safety, I was never worried about my safety until I got into a situation when I was 19. So for me, my desires led me down a path that got me hurt. Um, and so for me, I talk about where my desires took me to and how I ended up in that situation. And that situation created the desire in me to eventually become a writer. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, this is a follow up to that, um, do you feel like in your writing you also, so, you know, exploring obviously the, um, something about the sort of trauma of that moment, but then um, do you feel, uh, not a responsibility, but do you do you also feel like you want to explore, um, you know, how people come back from trauma to also then reclaim their sexuality even after, like violence or violation? You know, um, I'm sorry. Could you say it again? Yeah. Um, do you feel like do do you also in your writing use use it to not to both talk about like the um, you know explore the dynamics of of, of that kind of, of violence and violation, but also the a person or a character or you know like being able to then re how a person then finds a path to reclaim their own desire and sexuality when there's been a breach of you know whether you know violence or oh definitely or or yeah assault. yeah. Oh, definitely. I, 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 um, I've written so much about um, partners and individuals. Um, I actually, T Timothy Michael Dean, he was one of the individuals who um, ended up at Ed Buck's residence. And I knew Timothy um, back in 2005 or 2004. Um, and I also lived in West Hollywood. And I had wrote a short story um, about him. And I was really shocked when Timothy, when I had read one of, this was, he was still alive, and I had read one of his advertisements on rentboy.com, and I saved it because it was so kinky, it was so nasty, it was just so far out there, it was just, to me, it was just, it was just platinum, and I remember hitting him up on Facebook, and I told him that I had wrote a story about him, I was, I was really, really attracted to Timothy, I, I was very, very, I was crazy about him, and I wrote a story, and I shared some, some excerpts of it, and then he had never responded. Um, 
that side in my, my memoir, that side of my book. I also talk about a, a guy who I fell in love with um, for over a decade. He committed suicide. Um, I talk about a guy who is a fireman who I met when I used to be a prostitute on the streets of Los Angeles. And this was around the same time my sister died in a fire. And the chapter of that in my book is t- called t- is titled Fire Hazard. And he ended up being a Jehovah's Witness. So my book is not just based on trauma and assault and, you know, all that type of stuff. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, my literature, my stories. I have stories um, and stories and stories and never-ending stories. Um, I've had some, some very, very uh, wonderful sexual encounters and escapades and um, always looking forward to more safely. Um, so, no, it's it, – it, it, how do I – if anything, that situation, I would actually say, probably made me more um, – more not free but made me more it actually made me take more risks in life Hmm. after i experienced what i did Hmm. wow brontes i want to ask you to follow up on kind of what you said in the beginning around um you know writing about sex that isn't uh that's an anti-romantic way to write about sex right and and i i know that from your work that there's like a it's it's like very uh, like both like explicit, but also blase in the, the way that, you know, the, the take on it is very like, you know, and, and past the butter, right? <laughs> but, you know, like, but it's always, but it's these like, you know, situations that are like sometimes absurd, right? When you're really looking at what's happening. Talk about, um, you know, writing about sex from that perspective. And like you I'm saying that you are, you know, write from an anti-romantic place is a choice. So I'm curious about that. anti-erotic. Or anti-erotic, I'm sorry. It's anti-erotic, <laughs> right? <laughs> but in the context, but I will say, I mean, I'll say in the context of how Audre Lorde framed it, that, that the erotic also has a somewhat a romantic in that, that, bro- that broad sense, but. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, I like writing about kind of the occupational hazards of sex, right? Because there's just things that like, you know what I'm saying? Because like when you're watching like porn, right? There's like the reasons why you watch porn. But if you were watching porn and like someone farted or someone was like, oh, I have to pee now or all, you know what I'm saying? I, I feel like I essentially write about the interruptions or the parts that like kind of make it... Um, essentially like human for us to um, kind of, I don't know, be in these, um, be in these like realms together. So yeah, I, um, I, I just coined it anti-erotic because it's essentially, I'm still writing about sex, but it's something you may or may not want to jerk off to, so. Cool. And how does that, for those of you who work, you know, obviously in publishing and working with publishers, because that's I've like often an un sort of discussed uh, dynamic with writers is what it also means to be doing it in the context of like, you know, capitalism, right? And so dealing with like, whether it's literary agents, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, book publishers and um, and how do you, you know, do you have situations where you have to you know, respond to editors essentially about, uh, you know, what you choose to include in your work and, and how have you negotiated those kinds of pushes? So I see uh, Arunda shaking her head, so I'll, I'll take, give that to you first. Yeah, yeah I think that um, I'm just like really proud that I've built a reputation where anything I submit, you know, to a publisher is going to have a really healthy amount of masturbation, at least, and queer sex. So I usually, I mean, I think that it's really funny because I, I'm, as someone who is from an Arab culture, there's this idea that Arab culture is, you know, uh, repressed and where, oh, sexuality, everybody's like in a harem, et cetera. But in reality, um, you know, it's actually Westerners and West Europeans who are ashamed about their bodies, who are, uh, who feel inferior and who created sort of this other as um, kind of like a shadow to throw all their desires onto. So I feel like in publishing, you just, I feel like I just have to sort of just, if I'm dealing with a white editor, just especially a white woman editor, I say, 
no, I'm not going to tone this down. Like I've had an editor say, tone this down. Like, no, that's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, just kind of holding your ground and saying no, but also knowing that sometimes people will kill your piece. I had uh, Zora magazine killed a piece of mine and that's fine. You know, they commissioned a piece. I sent them a piece about like a woman getting fucked with a play knife. And I don't think the editors were able to handle it. They were like, wait, is she being fucked by knives? And I said, no, it's a play knife. It's just kinky. It's just a bunch of lesbians being kinky. Um, and the editors were like, no, <laughs> we cannot, you know? So, so yeah, it happens. And I think, yeah, anyway, I'm seeing the note that it's almost intermission time. So yeah. I, I just think that, yeah, Western yeah. publisher foods. At the, right, so we can pick up with that after the um, break if other folks want to talk about We their, really can. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a clue that that's something folks want to get into. So we'll pick up with that um, after the break and then talk about some, some other things as well. So um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Lambda Lit folks to take us into the break and uh, we'll see you in a few minutes. Hello, it is the intermission now. We will be playing for you uh, Lambda Literary 30th anniversary video. Lambda Literary traces its beginnings back to 1987 when L. Page Deacon McCubbin, owner of Lambda Rising Bookstore in Washington, D.C., published the first Lambda Book Report. The Lambda Literary Awards were born in 1989. The purpose of the awards in the early years was to identify and celebrate the best of lesbian and gay books in the year of their publication. What literature has always taught us is that only in tracing our individuality can we become universal? Thank you. The awards gave national visibility to a literature that had established a firm, if nascent, beachhead through a network of dynamic, lesbian and gay publishers and bookstores springing up across America. Lambda Book Report, meanwhile, grew into a comprehensive review periodical, and together the review and the awards cemented the reality that a distinct, definable LGBTQ literature existed. The award ceremony has consistently drawn an audience representing every facet of publishing. The awards honor some two dozen categories reflecting the wide spectrum of LGBTQ books. From the very first year, the Lammies have made the statement that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender stories are part of the literature of the world. In 2007, Lambda Literary founded its Writers' Retreat for Emerging LGBTQ Voices, a residency designed to offer intensive and sophisticated instruction to selected writers over a carefully designed one-week period. The retreat is intended to fill a void in the development of LGBTQ writers offering instructive feedback in a supportive environment. I always say that I, I recognize myself as a, a person of color and as a queer person and as a writer. They have never really been brave enough to put all of those things together. And I think that coming here has really put all of those things together for me. In 2012, Lambda launched the LGBTQ Writers in School program, where queer writers visit K-12 classes or queer youth organizations to discuss LGBTQ literature with young people. In 2017, the first Lambda Lit Fest took place in Los Angeles, featuring a week of readings, discussions, workshops, and other performances across the city. With the clarified mission, Lambda Literary fully intends to earn its acknowledged position as the world's premier LGBTQ literary organization. Anne Herbert once said, we can cry for a thousand years or have an accurate laugh. My goal has always been to write that sentence that causes that accurate laugh. Uh, because brevity is the soul of wit, 
I thank you so much for this award. Thank you. I just wanted to remind you that after intermission, there will be one or two more questions as part of the conversation, followed by an audience Q&A. You can find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please post all of your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat. We also want to let you know that we are posting closed caption recordings of all LitFest events on our YouTube channel throughout the week. And if you are able to donate to Lambda, you can do so by texting the word LitFest to 44321. That's L-I-T-F-E-S-T -E to the number 44321. Our intermission will be over in about 30 seconds. If the panelists could please return to their seats. Right, we are ready, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, we were just getting into a conversation about what it's like to um, you know, work you know, with publishers, right? And this also can include, um, you know, as a, cause I know several of you are also performers, what it's like to also, you know, try to, you know, book gigs doing the work that you do on the stage. And if there's, uh, you know, pushback that you get around content you know, that's, you know, too sexual or, or however people perceive, you know, your work. Can, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'll start by saying this. Like, I used to work for SF Weekly, right? And I, like, I wrote this article. I had this, like, weekly column called Amplified Feels. And so I, like, I wrote some story called, like, Trapped at a Daddy's House because this Black Daddy had, like, um... He had like blindfolded me and like tied me to like this like um, sling, sling is what you call it, right? And so he's like tied me to the sling, he's like fucking me or whatever. And in the middle of it, he's just like your daddy's perfect little boy. And I like start crying, you know, like tears of joy. Anyway, I put this in the fucking, the SF Weekly, right? And the next week the editor has me come into the office. And he's just kind of like, he's with the editor who hired me. And then the, the dude with the main dude was just kind of like, so uh, Bronte, uh, we like your work. It's really, it's really edgy, edgy. It's like, you know, edgy, literally like on the margins, but just wondering uh, how could I as a white man as a straight white man, Brontes interpret this work. And I'm just like, oh shit, I was supposed to write something for y'all. Like, I ain't even fucking, you know what I mean? Like, I ain't fucking know. See, the thing about that story for me, the most shocking part is not that I'm tied up in the sling, but that I found another black person to have sex with in San Francisco. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I just, like, that that's what I'm dealing with. That's issue, what I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that would be kind of the issue. That actually I, reminded I me would like that one. I, I do love that. It, it actually reminded me of um, many years ago, um, I had written a piece for that I pitched to the Village Voice. And it actually, it wasn't about sex, but it's just about, you know, kind of race and dealing with publishers. Um, and it was called, this was like 2003. It was called Why Gay Marriage Will Win, But Why It's Not the Point. 
And, um, and the editor I was working with was a white gay man who actually really uh, liked the piece. Um, and so he was like, oh, we're going to run this. And this was like in the height of like when, you know, Massachusetts had the decision and uh, like all the shit was happening around same sex marriage and, and all the right wing, you know, blowback. So, um, <laughs> so he was like, oh, I think yeah, I really like this, you know, or whatever. And so he came back to me like an email a few days later and said, um, well, Kenyon, we're not going to publish. We, I have to decline publishing this piece. And he said that when he sent it to uh other people on like this or like the opinion editors or whatever they sent him a formal letter back <laughs> like they all work in the same office but they sent him an actual like letter saying we're not running this piece because it basically goes against like what the kind of like white same sex same sex marriage movement is sort of on right now and because i was challenging some of the racism in that movement uh, they weren't going to publish it. And they said that it also contained what they put called other ideas, i.e. Black nationalism. <laughs> and, like, what? and so they didn't run it. And so at the time, I actually <laughs> took it to be like kind of hilarious. And I, I was like, well, you know, it's actually kind of a badge of honor to, because that's censorship. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm actually like, I've been censored. Like only good shit gets censored. So like, you know, Can you, can you? it is what it is, yeah. Kenyon, I think the name of your memoir should be I.E. Black Nationalism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing that Not down. Yet. <laughs> right. Uh, Can so, I ask? Yeah, go ahead, Kokomo. Yes, so as a Black non cis woman, poet, writer, and survivor, I grew up in, like, Chicago's South Side, like, woman with a Y, Black lesbian poetry scene, and it was traumatizing. They fucking hated me just for existing as a non cis woman. And I remember always being censored, always being edited, always even being told that, like, the way I sing, which, which is very bombastic, I was always told, like, that's problematic. I was always told that I was taking up too much space, you know, which is, which is that sexist trope that non cis women are taking up space as opposed to reclaiming it, right? This problematic narrative that, like, non-cis women are taking up space as men as opposed to powerful women and also what i would do in that space was i would talk about sexual assault like being a survivor of childhood sexual abuse incest things like that and i remember always having this one particular bitch her name oh i'm gonna say the whack i'm gonna say the whack bitch name but this bitch would always motherfucking like get her lame ass up they leave people where she falls first I don't use that word, but the other people call it terse because I don't identify as trans. I'm non cis and intersex. But like these are people who hate non cis women. And every time I would discuss a topic of, um, every time I would write about sexual assault, this bitch would always get up and like say that it's not sexual assault because I'm not a cis woman. So that's my experience. Yes. Wow. And that traumatized me. I was a fucking teenager. And this happened for four fucking years because like I'm an OG. I'm like the first black non cis woman to like make it as a poet, a musician, like the main, I'm the Lauryn Hill of this shit. And I had to pave the way. And the, pay, the way we got paved was we, we, we only had to be around like the SGLs, the single Jake, the, the single, the singles, the, uh, the, the same gender loving gay man who fucking hated me because they thought I was a punk who didn't just want to accept being a man. And then we had the fucking musty dykes who hated me for like being a fucking intersex diva. And I'm just like, will you all leave me the fuck alone? Will you fucking like tag the night, just leave me the fuck alone and leave my innocent body alone? Just every time I turned around, I couldn't speak about sexuality. I couldn't speak about fucking like assault. I couldn't even speak about my womanhood. Like these bitches would literally lock, laugh in the audience when I would say I was a woman. And so like that's my experience being a non cis musician and poet is like being the first. The bitch who had to like kick it down and people being like, What the fuck is this? So my existence is my existence is censored. But I refuse to be edited. Right? And like people call me crazy, but it's like, Am I crazy or are you just oppressive and you don't realize the brilliance that is innately in black non cis fucking women, bitch? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and that's that face I was making. Actually, since we're talking about this, in 2014, I got gang raped. And like, I wrote Reacquainted with Life after that, throughout that entire process. And I was gaslit into thinking that it was my fault. And one of the motherfuckers who did it, I hit his ass up. 
finally saying, fuck you, you musty bitch. And so he hit me back up saying, you're fucking crazy. And that's when y'all saw me making that face. I was like, so niggas want to, so Wayne Brady going to have to slap a bitch. So what I'm realizing is that, like, it's always the work. It's always the work of reminding myself that I'm not fucking crazy. People are just oppressive, and they don't believe that black non-sex women deserve freedom. Sexual freedom, verbal freedom, financial freedom, freedom of any kind. But fuck you bitches, I've got it. Can, yes, can I... Can I have two? Can I have two or three minutes to read an excerpt? Sure. sure. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so this is chapter eleven from my my book um, from my memoir, um, Shooting Range, and it's titled "How Much." By late two thousand four, I was attempting to wean myself off slinking around in the shadows of the night and lingering on corners. While city sanitation workers were out tending to the streets and the sun was starting to shine, I was str- strutting north on Vine like a peacock in my high heels and miniskirt past Sunset Boulevard. That area is where female prostitutes usually hoard with their pimps. I noticed a truck with tinted windows and two young black males blasting hip hop. They followed me as I was walking home from a night of partying. While almost a few feet away from my Hollywood Boulevard, from Hollywood Boulevard, five minutes from my apartment, a passenger leaned out the window and yelled, get with a real pimp, bitch. You're on a track now. You need a real nigga in your life. I did my best to not make any eye contact or acknowledge him. You fucking sexy ass bitch. You hear me talking to you in an angry voice. He roared. I smacked my lips, rolled my eyes, giggled and picked up my pace while tossing my hair, wiggling my ass and clutching my purse tightly. I enjoyed the attention that I was attracting because the men thought I was a real woman. I'd never been accosted by men like that before and couldn't believe it was happening. The truck sped up and passed me, disappearing for just a moment before returning and making an abrupt talk and cut me off at the corner. The passenger from the truck jumped out in silence, which was quickly broken when his handgun dropped to the ground with a thud. I backed up and took a defensive stance. I placed my hand over my heart and in a shrill, high-pitched masculine voice with a furrowed bro that signified a combination of confusion and disapproval, thinking it would make a difference, yelled, I'm not a woman. The guy quickly swooped down and retrieved his gun from the ground, jumping back into the truck. As the tires screeched off, I ducked around the corner to get my breath while composing myself. Wondering whether they were going to snatch my purse or kidnap me. Oh, thank you. Um, mm. Yeah, I was going to. Th- so thank you, Nishan, for bringing us into that. I was actually going to do a section for each of the writers to be able to read a, a short excerpt so um, of their work. So if other folks want to do, okay. you know, oh, you you all good? We were we was getting there. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, want to. Um, you know, do about two, two to three minutes um, of any of their own original work, and then we'll open it up um, to questions. I have a couple more questions, but I can roll those into, you know, into the Q and A with the with the folks. Can I say something else? Uh, sure. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna read. Um, I was a lambda. Lambda Fellow in 2016, nonfiction with Sarah Showman, and I had workshopped a short story called Lillian's Lure, and it's based on me um, advertising in this little cheap um, newspaper called LA Express, and I had heard that a celebrity was um, looking for the trans girls again, and he was going through a divorce, and so I put an ad in the paper, and I used the name Lillian. Lillian is his mother's name, and so um, I got a call one morning, and it was from a white guy called me and said he wanted to stop by. And so I was like, okay, you know, the guy got close and everything. And when he got to my home, it was a different voice. It was a black guy. And he told me who he was. And he told me that he wouldn't come upstairs because he didn't want to be, you know, video recorded, taped or whatever. This was in 2000 and 2006. This was around the time that dream girls was in production, the movie dream girls. And so what I did, it worked. I put an advertisement in, in the magazine using his mother's name and, um, went down to his car and he actually asked me if my name was really Lillian. And I, of course I lied again and told him my name was Lillian. And um, he said he would call me later on that night and he never did. But anyway, after that situation, I definitely knew that I needed to be writing because if I could write a little three or four sentence advertisement and um, lure celebrity to my home and for him to give me uh, several hundred dollars and stuff, I knew obviously I was gifted at writing. Um, I want to back up real quick to what she said regarding censorship. Um, the material that I write about, it's, 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 some of it is traumatic, not all of it is traumatic, but basically my situation is me um, exploiting the very people in the same institutions, institutions that have exploited me. 
it's my turn to exploit them. And I'm finding now, uh, respectfully, I'm finding now that um, with me attempting to do that, uh, publishers, you know, they're not interested. Literary agents are not interested. Um, but it's interesting because being a part of the LGBT community with this, the whole Black Lives Matter situation, we hear all these stories. People say, you know, they want our stories out there. Um, they want to hear from trans. And I'm actually saying, I'm like scratching my head at this point because I'm saying to myself like, wow, you know, it, it can't be because of who I am because you, you have all these trans in the media, you have all these gay men in the media. But I find it very interesting that I'm actually being ignored. And, and, and I have this proposal, literary agents, you know, they're not interested and I'm not, you know, crying and I'm not, dis I wouldn't say that I'm not disappointed. It's just very interesting when you have a story that I would, I guess people are afraid to touch. Um, and I've had enough people in my life who've tried to censor me. And I'm at that point where I, I guess I just say to myself like, wow, because I write nonfiction. What do you do when you live in a world where when you write the truth, when you write nonfiction, and people don't want to hear it. You know, going back to what, Co 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 I don't want to butcher her name, Kokomo? Co Kokomo, yeah. You can probably talk about Kokomo. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just interesting when you write nonfiction and, and it, it's so disturbing or it's so unreal that, you know, I'm getting, oh, you know, I don't, don't know how to market it, don't know how to market it. But you know how to market all the other trash. You know how to market all the other filth. You know how to market all the other racist bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in this country, and e even at this point in time in history, and you have these publishers and these litter agents, and they all are acting as if they're for black, black people and black lives mattering. And here I'm sitting, I don't feel, I don't feel, I don't, I don't see it, and I don't feel it at all. Yeah. And I've totally cut my social media off because I get to a point where I'm just like, okay, these people, they're full of shit. These people in this publishing industry, they are. Yeah, I mean, like, so, <laughs> Gogo, you want to jump in? I was like, girl, social media ain't shit, girl. Ooh, I'm <laughs> over here ready to burn the fucking internet. It's just like, why don't people just die? All people do is just get up and say the most oppressive bullshit, and it's just like, oh, and then just generate the most oppressive art. It's just like, give us something real. Take me to the next level now. You know, the title of my book is Shooting Range. So if someone writes a book titled Shooting Range, obviously there's going to be some bullets flying. There's going to be some blood. There's going to be some dead people. There's going to, there's going to be some pain. This country is, is at this point, it, it, is, it is just that, a shooting range. Now, of course, we know people want to escape and they want to, you know, the, the ha live happily ever after and the white picket fence and all of that stuff. It's just, that's not reality. And I understand that's why we do have fiction because people do want that escape. But again, it's just interesting because it's just, it's, it's, I read stories like mine in the news and a lot of survivors don't ever get to tell their, their, their stories or their tale. And so now you have one, um, and it's just, it's just the, 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 the silence and the rejection. I, I'm, 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 I'm just, you, you start to wonder um, as, a, as an artist, as a writer, um, as a black person, uh, what, what is the problem that these people have with hearing uh, these types of stories, no matter how disturbing they are? There's an idea. If, 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 if they can make all of these movies and publish all this other stuff, what, where's my opportunity at? How long am I going to have to fucking wait? I'm being told, oh, just wait, just wait, just wait. I'm getting older and older and older. I have, chronic health con I have a chronic health condition. I would like to see my book published soon, very soon. Yeah. But all these white people continuously, they get their books, books published. It's not a problem. And I know that there, there's black people getting their books published and all this stuff, and there's a ton of them and stuff, and that's great. That, that, that is good for them. I would have never thought that this business was as competitive and, and, and is as fucked up as it is. And I come from a very, very fucked up background. But the people that I meet in this business, they might as well be out pouring their ass on the street and telling their ass and doing those types of things because those are the types of personalities that these literary agents have and that these publishers have and that these writers have. Yeah, I thank you for that. I don't mean to take up so much time, but yeah. Okay, um, I think it was necessary. And um, 
after this, we should talk because I, I have had a bunch of run ins with some p publishers recently, too. And because I don't do, you know, right now, you know, and it's, this is no shade to nobody. A lot of like there's a lot of stuff happening right now for a lot of black gay writers that I really enjoy. Oh, it's no shade, no shade at all. I don't do, no, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm just saying for, for my situation that like I have, um, you know, but I don't, I don't, I write political stuff. I don't, I don't write in a kind of, you know, confessional, you know, you know, memoir. biography, memoir way in a way mm -hmm. that a lot of things are right now. And, and like, unless I'm willing to do that, I basically, can't, I can't get my book out either, but that's another story. So um, in any case, um, I want to um, just ask a question um, and, and try to get Rhonda and Brontes in here on this one. Um, I, I think there's a, a something that uh, kind of came up now about social media. I'm, I'm curious about, you know, how, you know, Brontes, you or Rhonda engage social media, especially as writers who write about sex, because there's so much, um, and even from within our own communities, as whether it's like black folks or queer or trans folks, or whatever, but there's, there's a particular way in which, um, you know, uh, there is a little bit of like, there's, I, I wouldn't describe it as cancel culture per se, but there's a kind of meanness and a kind of like, uh, you know, challenging things that are not like conventional in a certain kind of way. So I wonder how you, like, you have to deal with people who respond to you online because you write about sex and sexuality in ways uh, that are explicit where even people within the community are like, that's fucked up or this, that or whatever. And so I'm gonna, yeah, first get, hold on Coco, I wanna hang on for one second. I'm gonna get uh, Brontes and Rhonda here on this and then we'll loop back around and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Ooh, um, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I definitely feel like um, the kind of policing of tone is a it's kind of like a weird cultural inversion you know um i was in germany and we were talking about how like basically it seems like the right is now using all the tactics of the left fully and the left are like leaning in on the more like kind of um i don't know kind of like the more like dead in like like the weirdness of the right you know what i'm saying like i don't know i just i feel like all, all of a sudden it's just like i don't know like uh we were like partying and writing and doing all this art. And then, um, I don't know, a lot of like uh, intense like questions around politicality come up. Um, but just to keep this short, whenever I encounter it, I just remember that I was born canceled and then just exit the conversation rationally. Yeah. So Rhonda, if you want to respond to that too. Yeah, that's that's right on. I think that like you can't you, oh. you just you can't fight with people who are you just cannot fight with people who are biased against you and who hate you anyway, right? Like, so, but for me, I mean, okay, so for me to exist like online, like I have no problem, like you know, with any of this, and I have an OnlyFans and. I, so the, the interactions I've gotten over the years, because I'm a fat woman um, and because I'm Arab and Muslim, I've gotten like these weird reactions that are just, I, I put them in a file and it's just basically, people have photoshopped me on, uh, on like uh, um, Jabba the Hutt. They have photoshopped me <laughs> like as a giant slime ball, as, like a Godzilla. I've been dehumanized a lot on the internet. And at the same time, I, I, I get these like DMs that are just like, I'm, I worship your tits or here's a hundred dollars just for, because I love your tits or, um, send, you know, I, I wish you would crush my dick. Um, I can't wait for you to fuck my asshole, you know, just because those are things I do in my real life. Um, and that I, that I write about honestly. So, I think it's fine. It's it's like it, everything's gonna be hurled at me, but it's really just I'm centered in what I'm trying to do and the art I'm trying to put out. And um, yeah, 
Thank you. So, uh, Kokomo, I know you were jumping to get on this. So I'll let you uh, respond to that question, and then we'll open it up to the, uh, to the audience. June Jordan said it best. I am not wrong. Wrong is not my name. As a Black woman, I am constantly reminding myself that I am not crazy. I did not make it up. I do belong. We live in a world where Black women are gaslit by entire communities. Someone said that on social media. Like, sexual assault happened to us. It happened to me. And I was gaslit by everybody who came from my own party and who did it. So I'm still, that was 24. I'm 32. I'm still reminding myself. It, did, it didn't happen. Uh, I didn't deserve that. I'm still reminding myself I'm not crazy, right? And so there's that, and then there's, um, and then there's a component because at that party, I was sexual. And so there was, like, this sequestering of my sexuality and my sanity. And I thought that I was insane because I was sexual, but no, society is insane because it doesn't give Black women the space to be sexual. And I'm a constant reminding myself that, like, the pathologizing that I get for my sexuality and my body, it's just racism. Right? Because when black women are free sexually, we're whores, we're thoughts, we're crazy. But when white women do it, they're supermodels. So I'm consistently reminding myself that, like, I'm at the bottom, but if there's, like, a drain and it's all streaming down here, on top of it is freedom. At the end of the day, you can call me crazy all you want to. Crazy is just another synonym for free. Hmm. I say. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> um, we're going to, uh, yeah, open it up to um, some questions. So please, uh, you know, if you're watching, put your chest questions in the chat box. Um, but uh, first question um, I'll ask. Um, so these are, I mean, there are a lot of questions about kind of how your, you know, kind of personal, you know, sex, sexual experiences, of sex life influence your writing. Um, what is one of the most memorable sexual experiences or realizations of your body that uplifted and changed you? So one more time. Uh, what, are, what is one of the most memorable sexual experiences or realizations about your body that uplifted and changed you? I don't like sucking dick. Like, I just don't like sucking dick. Like, I'll do it as a nice symbolic gesture but like, I don't like it and I don't have to like it. And also I'm just always like, what? Like when a dude invites me over and he's just like, let's just like, I'm an oral top or whatever. I'm like, you gonna pass up all this good ass pussy for a mouth? Like, are you a faggot? Like what is going on here? Like, I can't. And so I really, when I realized that I didn't have to suck dick anymore, that's really when I reclaimed my pussy power and it just started spewing out glitter and fucking rainbows yeah. and shit it was just like my pussy became ultimately powerful the day i realized i do not have to suck dick ever fucking again yo <laughs> i don't want to say something. who's going next i'll say something after someone else go ahead no you go ahead yo it's interesting because so in my book mm, in my book rear tournament life I did like this thing called Galactic Bitch Slap, which is like quotes that I come up with that just are random but true. And one of the quotes was, the absence of pleasure does not mean the, ab the presence of pleasure does not, the, pr the presence of pleasure does not mean the absence of rape. So this whole scenario I've been discussing, my gang rape at 24, which is the greatest trauma of my adult life, it's the greatest trauma, but it's also the greatest triumph because that was a play party that I threw. And I was sucking like it wasn't shit. I was throwing that pussy in a motherfucking hurricane. So I was popping that pussy like pussy sitting has been popped. I was popping that pussy like God damn it, God was gonna God was gonna give a bitch a tip. And so it was like I look back at that night and I feel so liberated, but I also feel the shame because then I'm like, Oh, what is that why I got got assaulted? And so I have to remind myself that you have to I, I remind myself it's I remind myself the power is in the perspective. I can look at that night and be traumatized, and then I can also look at that and still feel triumphant because I was out fucking every bitch in that party. And so that was also a moment of like triumph in my soul. In my soul, you know, I just I was sucking dick, and I just I was I, in my soul. I high sized Iyana Van Zandt because I feel like she was proud of me because I feel like my ancestors saw me popping that pussy, and I just. Whoa, I loved it. But then I remember the trauma and I have to remind myself, girl, remember the good. 
Just remember the good, bitch. Because what the fuck purpose is continuously remember the bad, Coco? What, bitch, how many psych wars do you need to go back to, mind? You never need it in the first place. Just remember fucking that dick, popping that pussy, and having a good time. Fuck the rape. Mm-hmm. I say, uh, Rondo and Nishan. Oh my God, Coco, I love you so much! <laughs> you did you, did you ask, ask that question again? Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, what is the most, what is one of the most memorable sexual experiences or realizations about your body that uplifted and changed you? Mm -hmm. Um, when I was 19, I was working in the, the Beverly Center. This was February and I met, I met a guy and we started dating and he would have been the first, he would have been the first older guy that I started dating. Um, we weren't in a relationship relationship, but I would have to say, um, I was, I was 19, I was eight, I was 19. Yeah. 18 going on 19. Um, I would have to say that that was the, the, the first, that was the first situation where I had met someone, a, a older guy, a black guy who was a gentleman, um, who, who treated me the way I wanted to be treated. Um, but because I was still young and, and going through puberty, I totally went on a detour. And um, based on my behavior, I, I wouldn't say I ruined everything, but it, it, it ended our uh, situation, which, which had a very beautiful beginning. And that's actually the first chapter of my book as well. Mm. So, yeah. So um, we're... Uh, this is one of my questions. I'm going to get this in here because I want to ask it for you. So in the midst of um, everything going on, um, you know, in the world from uh, the COVID-19. Oh, I'm sorry, Randa. Uh, Randa, did you want to answer that question? Oh, you're good? Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, given everything that's going on, the COVID-19 pandemic, all of the uh, uprisings due to, uh, you know, police homicides of Black people to the you know fucking separation of children and uh you know families at the border to uh you know murders and violence against uh black trans women um it's a lot <laughs> to be living through at, at one you know r right now um and i'm curious about how is the current state of the world um the things i mentioned and, and others uh impacted your work and how you're writing either in terms of your process or things that you're interested in now or is it more difficult or is it actually more you're more engaged and 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 writing more now i don't for me i'm not i don't think i'm writing i think i'm like making making things that aren't necessarily with words um so like I, the, the, the most recent thing I made was this, like this mermaid New York Times that I can show you guys. Um, and um, it has like a bunch of like mermaid fuckboy ads and like wedding announcements between uh, queer non-cis women and uh, shit about like Israel sucking clams and the police being fucked up and so I think just kind of like embracing uh, like the like other forms and being okay with the fact that like my brain cannot I can't I can't write a novel right now I'm I am first of all I'm stoned from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed so and so like, yeah it's just not it's and yeah, I don't want to expect that of myself right now I think People who are inspired right now to write novels, amazing. I love you. Um, but if you're not, and you just literally want to like eat cheese and write a dick sometimes, like that's <laughs> not a cheesy dick though. <laughs> Listen, never. Um. <sighs> Yeah, how are you living through the, the current state of the world and how's it impacting your, your work or desire to work as a writer or performer? Is, is someone going? 
I don't want to take up too much space. I'll answer, but who's going next? I don't want to jump in. I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. Okay. Okay. Oh, am I going now? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Michelle, oh, okay. I, I, I know I went on a tangent earlier and I was bitching and everything. Um, I recently completed um, a book proposal and I sent it out to several litter agents and um, some reviewed it and uh, rejected me. Um, and so I'm the type of person, this has always been throughout my life. I've always had to be the one to um, handle my business. And I mean, handle my business because even at this point, I deal with people and they take their own good time. Um, they're forgetful. And sometimes I just say to myself, you know, is it, is it just me or, you know, and I don't expect five star service or whatever. Anyway, um, I sent it to some publishers and a publisher, a publisher at a big five responded and um, she read the proposal and she wasn't interested. And I reached out to another because I don't believe in waiting. I don't, I don't believe in waiting. We see pe people are dropping dead from COVID-19. People are getting shot. All types of things. Right? Tomorrow is not promised. And people will tell you, wait. Wait for what? Wait for you? Anyway, I sent it to a, a publisher, and the publisher told me that they weren't interested in reading my book proposal. And I was just like, you know, okay. But she said that she was interested in reading my memoir. And so I have four, four or five drafts of my memoir. And so at this point, I didn't plan on going back and editing it and rewriting and doing some things that I needed to do to get it ready for a, a publisher. Um, but that's exactly what I did. So I would have to say that I've spent my time not only working on a book proposal, um, but now my actual memoir, which is being edited um, by a professional developmental ed editor and everything. Um, so I'm just waiting to get that to, to the publisher and I'm hoping that there's some positive feedback from her in, in that situation. So I feel, I, I do feel hopeful um, in that sense and um, grateful that um, this publisher would be the first one to take a look at my actual memoir. So Excellent. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. We all are, thank you. Um, Coco Abrantes. Um, I, I just really appreciate in this time um, how, um, it just seems like I meet more people now at readings. So when I do readings there, it used to just be like 20 or 30 people in Oakland, like at a reading. But like ever since COVID, like I'll be in like these Zoom chats with just like so many people from everywhere. And I, I feel like that's been like kind of nice. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying I'm feeling really a lot. I love vibe. I'm glad to see all y'all here. Mm -hmm. Um, This has been the most, productive, viable year of my fucking life. I wrote two feature films. I am working on my album, another EP. I have a brand new record company. It's like COVID came and it just made me like take it to the next level because the plan was already to come back with the music, things like that, you know? Um, but now it's like, wow. I'm writing in ways I've never written before. It's like I'm pushing myself to upper echelons in my literary canon. It's like I'm using words, similes, plays. It's like I'm forcing myself to tell stories I haven't told. I'm forcing myself to tell stories I already told, but from a different perspective, from a different point of, in, uh, from a different point of the pain. And it's just like, wow, it's like I'm digging in myself and it's like I'm forcing myself to get into therapy because as deep as I'm digging, it's like, wow, this shit is like exercise. It's like the way a motherfucker go to the gym and, and motherfucking weight lift, it's like, ah, that's the way I write, man. It's like, okay, get eight hours, get, get a gallon of water in, get 30, get 30 minutes on the treadmill, and then motherfucking write. I force myself for two hours a day. It's like, oh, my God, I have this featureless film that I'm coming out for my next EP. Just wait, I'm just wait, y'all. I'm proud of myself. It's like I'm telling stories I've always told about rape, but from mm. different perspectives. I'm telling stories I've always told about sexuality, but from different perspectives. I'm telling stories I've always told about me, but from different perspectives. And I'm just, I'm excited and I'm scared and I'm grateful. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple more um, questions from the chat um, that'll probably close us out. Um, so first one up. Um, uh, this question is about um, 
Queer, so it says, I feel like for so long, coming of age and queer lit has uh, been connected to sex and sexual awakening, but it seems that younger queers are having an awareness of being queer without being sexual, and some want to separate these two things. Um, so how do you feel as queer writers of sex and sexuality about, about that? So as a, so I can maybe reframe. So as a writer, um, you know, who, you know, everybody here writes, a, you know, a lot about sex and sexuality and desire um, and, you know, a kind of growing portion of the community who's sort of coming into queer identity, but isn't necessarily uh, tying it to, uh, you know, sex or desire in this, you know, same way. Um, you know, how do you feel about that or feel about that maybe even just in terms of your work, in terms of, uh, you know, writing about queerness, uh, decoupled haha -ha, from sex well i think it's i think mostly i don't i think what's happening is people are starting to recognize that gender and sexuality are different things there's some overlap but you can be a gender right and whatever i mean who you are is whatever you choose so there's also ace uh young queers so celebrating asexuality, celebrating, just knowing that there's, there are so many uh, variations of us. We are multiplicity, we are just multiplicity. We are abundant, we are, there's so much. And to categorize us is, it's just not gonna happen. So knowing that, that and, and, and not being like those fucking turfs that Kokomo was talking about, you know, just internalize, internalizing misogyny, saying that, you know, oh, if you're going to be queer, you need to be fucking, um, you need to be fucking a woman and not married to a man. I'm talking about women. Who... Anyway, shit like this. Like, I think that it's important to fight for a more inclusive kind of take on sexuality it, it, and, and on gender and expression. I think if I was, I think if I was heterosexual, I still would have had a, a very, very um, colorful and creative sex life. Um, I don't think that I would have been any different. I don't think it would have been any different. Um, and I write because I like sex and I've had a sex addiction for almost 20 years. Um, but for, for, for me... Is sex addiction a real thing? I'm just kidding. I could, um, I, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, for some people, I don't write about, I mean, you know, just because you're queer LGBTQ, you don't have to write about your sexual experiences because, you know, there are people who are asexual, pansexual. Um, everyone is not sexual. And I, and I understand that. And I understand that everyone doesn't want to read about someone, you know, um, selling their ass on a street corner and, you know, um, sucking dick and guns getting pulled out and, you know, running from the cops and all that stuff. I, I totally do get that. But there is still an audience for that. And there's plenty of people that enjoy that. And I think people should be given that people should be given the opportunities to um, create and to publish and to write and to sell. They should be given those opportunities. Um, my whole thing is, you know, for me, I mean, obviously I need a literary agent. Um, if I didn't need a literary agent, trust me, I would not be talking to them at all. Uh, what would be the purpose? But they obviously are the middle person, the, the, the middle man. Um, you, you have to stay true to, to, to yourself or to your literature or to your art or to your creativity. Um, there's no way that I could water down my, my literature because so much of it is, is based on my experiences um, living as a gay man and as a trans woman. I can't, I can't, I can't, er I can't erase those experiences, which have, um, which are based around my sexuality and my gender. Thank you. I, I could, there's, no, I, there's no way that I could present it. Thank you. So I'm going to um, just close with one other question uh, here in the uh, Q and A. Um, I think is a good kind of one to end on. Um, what opportunities would you like to see um, for your uh, talents that don't exist currently? Like what, what's, you know, and I would maybe tie that to also a question about, you know, um, you know, what's next for you? How can people get in touch with you? Those sort of things too, as, um, or Pete, how can people find your work? 
I want to be like Rihanna, where it's like, because I heard Fenty is coming out with a Tupperware line next year. And so really that's my goal is to move from sex goddess to domestic goddess. Not saying that those things are mutually exclusive, but if I could put out a Tupperware line and marry a white man, yeah. Welcome to Montez, if you just start a $50 a month lingerie subscription and send me no panties, I would pay for it. I mean, I would just pay for it. Excellent. So what, uh, what opportunities would you like to see for your talents that, that don't currently exist? Um, I'll say one, I was going to answer the other question. I love that queerness is no longer being sexualized because I always say my queerness was never sexual. It was always like artistic, like, right. My voice is queer. My fashion is queer. My body is queer. And then like moving forward, I bring that into what I do with my music, Queer Soul, you know, I, uh, with Queer Soul, it's giving me the ability to create what I haven't seen because I am a musician first and a poet second, right? My poetry informs my music, but like, I always wanted to create a genre of music where like, as a black woman who was queer, I could feel seen because I always felt like Whitney Houston not being allowed to be a full queer woman was what drove her to addiction. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, you know, the rigmarole of the industry it was like she was born and bred in the church and she's called insane just for having robin robin as her friend and what if luther was able to sing to a, another man what if Tevin was what if Tevin campbell was able to still have a career even though he got caught masturbating in a fucking theater and said he was trisexual like you know what if he had so much water frank ocean you know and like i, I what if there was like a black diva who fucking sung with a, a contralto voice with deep intersex and was singing beautiful fucking music. That's what I want to see. And that's what I do. And it's called Queer Soul. And I got some shit coming out for y'all. This is Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, any last uh, thoughts, uh, things you're working on, things that you would like to see for yourself in the future, ways you feel like the, you would want to see in the, the industry to support your work? Please, please, uh, order my book or or uh, tell your library to start carrying it. Also, I got some good news for the first time in 17 years that I've been trying to sell an audiobook of one of my books. One of my audiobooks finally sold yesterday. And to me, that's massive. Nobody, my first book was five years. Nobody, nobody. And I'm gonna fucking read it because it's my sex life, my body, my titties that these experiences, these mountainous experiences happened in. So I'm very excited about it. Um, yeah. I, I, know, I know this is a long shot, but it would be nice. It would be nice if, if, um, if Kamala and Joe Biden are elected president and vice president, it would be nice if she would um, do something to um, bring back Backpage. I miss Backpage yeah. so much. Oh. And Oh. It's not so much because of the it's not so much because of the money the money that was nice but I miss my phone ringing um, I miss massaging married men I miss massaging single men I miss the the um, while I'm entertaining them they're entertaining me I just miss that I miss the whole I mean I know there's some other websites but Backpage was just perfect and I wish Backpage would okay. just come back I really do. Woo! I hope with that. So yeah, so a call to end uh, uh, foster uh, uh, SESTA laws in this country. Hopefully, with the new administration, be a shot for that, and we can get back page and all our nice things back. <laughs> I I support that. Um, thank you so much, uh, Nishan Anderson, Kokomo, Brontes, Fernell, and Rhonda Gerard. Um, thank you so much, Lambda Literary. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you next. And uh, thank you again to uh, all the folks who attended this and uh, will be watching this uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all the panelists. And thank you for the audience. This was a very special Lambda Literary After Dark. Um, uh, I hope you can, um, if you haven't already, I hope you can donate tonight. Um, yet again, you can donate by typing LitFest 
code LitFest to 44321. That's LitFest to the code to number 44321. Um, even giving as little as $10 ensures that we can keep bringing you programs like tonight in the months and years ahead. So thank you for um, coming out to our Climax event. Um, this has been a fantastic series. Um, and we hope to do more work like this in the future. So thank you and everyone have a good night. All right. We all just sign off. <laughs>